The story of Gideon's my favorite because if you read it and you read it like a and you and you take the lessons out of it, it's really one of the more powerful lessons that I found in the entire Old Testament. Um, in those days, Israel, uh, there was the twelve tribes of Judah, right? And this is when they supposedly turned their back on the Lord, and and they were getting wiped out every year. And what was happening was. There was a, there was a, you know, back in those days, marauders or um, groups of people would band together to protect each other, right? Well, this one got so big, it's the biggest that any of them ever got. It was, they say it was well over a million people. And usually you may have had five, ten thousand of these, you know, these bands that would get together. But this was the Midianites. And... And there was over a million people. Their eastern army, which would sweep through Judea, would sweep through Israel every year, was over 135,000. What they would do when they would come in is they practiced scorched earth. Does anybody know what that is? They would take all the food and then burn the fields. They would get as much water as they needed out of the wells, and then they would fill them in. <laughs> what does that do to a people? It kills them. It completely kills them. They would take all of the childbearing women with them and force them into slavery and bearing children for them. They would take all of the children and the and the youngsters and raise them as their own. They would kill every warrior they could as they came through. So demolish any army. Right? About the only ones left were the ones that were hiding and sneaking and running. And Gideon was one of those. So Gideon, the story opens up, and Gideon is sneaking through caves, sneaking from here to there, trying to make it to a place where he had hidden some food for his family. And it was his it was his job to go get it. So so when the story opens up there, he's sneaking around. And, and, and it says that an angel of the Lord came to see him. All right, showed up. And, and when the angel of the Lord showed up, do you know what he said? He said, Hail, which is a sign of great respect that you give to a, to a great leader. Hail, mighty man of valor. Gideon is running for his life. He's no warrior. He's sneaking around just to try to get some food that they had hidden because everything else had been destroyed. And and literally an angel shows up and, and if you study angelic beings throughout the Bible, they literally cannot lie. They can they're called messengers. They can only deliver the message that God gave them to deliver and they have to deliver it exactly the way it was supposed to. If you study it, that's how it's supposed to be. So literally, God was saying, Hail, mighty man of valor. Isn't that crazy? He's sneaking around. He's no mighty man. He's not a warrior. And Gideon goes, What? He goes, You're crazy. So do you not know that out of the 12 tribes of Israel, Manasseh, mine, is the least? Out of all the families in my tribe, this is what he says, mine is the least. He's like the bottom of the bottom. Right? Sneaking around, and that's how he saw himself. So, the angel of the Lord, Gideon says, don't you know what's happening? The Midianites come through here every year. They destroy our people. You call me a mighty man of valor? He's mad. I can, I can feel it when I'm reading it. I read between the lines anyway. It's first Joseph's second opinion. And, uh, and I can just feel it. I can feel that if it was me. If I, couldn't, if I couldn't cut the mustard for my family and I was the least one in it, and I could sneak around and try to provide food, and man, everybody else in my family is doing, all the other men are doing better than me, all the other tribes are doing better than me. Man, that's a, that's a shitty place to be. That's a crazy place to see yourself. Right? 
And then an angel showed up and said, Hail, mighty man of valor. You know what? I would have heard that. It's sarcastic as hell. It would have sounded so sarcastic because I would have been seeing and hearing it through my crap colored hearing aids and glasses. <laughs> right? And, and so he complains. He goes, you know, where have you been? He said, what? I can just see him sitting there like, what, the, what are you doing here? Like, don't you see? We have prayed. We've asked for your help. Where have you been? He's talking to that angel. I would have been pissed. Would you have been pissed? Seven years they've been demolished every year. Mm. Boom. The Midianites have come through. Seven straight years every year. And he says that. Where have you been for seven years? And he's going, why haven't you done something about that? We're supposedly your people. Does anybody know what the angel said to him? After he complained and whined and told the story. Does anybody know what he said to him? He goes, go in your power and save your people. Oh. Go is an action word, right? Quit sneaking around and go do something about it. Oh, you want us to? You want, you want get what, heaven to come down and do something? We already put the power in you. Go in whose power? Your power. He didn't say go in the name of the Lord. <laughs> he didn't. He said go in your power and save your people. And then he was like, hey, that's all I was here to say. <laughs> he was gone story bothered me a little bit at first when I first read it and it's become my favorite because we always are looking outside of us for somebody to do something for us or or if it's God's will if I'll do this and I'll pray about it and all this other stuff and I get it and I, prayer's not bad but man this story set me free because that was me I was always blaming out here looking out here for the answer when all I had to do was go you know what I'm gonna go in my power and save my family it is the ultimate in personal responsibility. And so, if you don't know the rest of the story, it's crazy how stuff works. Gideon goes, he wants to see if God's with him. He tests him some more times because he's a doofus. And every time, like every time the test turns out like it's true, you're gonna, you're gonna do great things. And he's like, no, nah, let's do it a different way. You know, and he would do another thing, three different tests. That's where it says throughout the fleece, that's where the saying comes from. But to fast forward the story for lack of time, he recruits through all the tribes of Israel, he recruits 32,000 people. 32,000. What was the size of the Midianite army, the eastern portion of their army? 130. 135. 135,000 people. Those aren't good numbers. Those are not good odds. Would you want to leave 30,000 against 130,000? No way. Not a chance. That would suck. But Gideon was going to do that. He had raised the army. He was taking them there. And um, Angel Lord showed back up and he was like, so this army you've raised. Uh, some of them are faint of heart. Tell them if they want to be with their families, just go home. Gideon's like, are you serious? He's like, oh yeah. So he tells him, you how many leave? How many leave? 20,000. He is left there with 12,000 people. And he's like, so the odds weren't bad enough. <laughs> now there's 12,000 of us. Against 135,000. Hmm. <coughs> And I think God loves working this way. Angel Lord shows back up and he's like, too many of you. Too many people. <laughs> he's like, you got too many. There's only 135,000 of them. You got too many with 10, 12,000. Yep. And Gideon's like, to the river. what? <laughs> what do you want me to do now? To the river. What do you want me to do now? And he's like, I tell you what you do. Tell them to go down the river, get a drink. The ones that are careful and scoop the water up and drink out of it like that, send them all home. The, this, is, this is how the story is. He said the ones 
that are like dolls that get down and lap it up with their tongue. He said, only keep those. I heard it preached the opposite way growing up. I thought it was the opposite way. It is not. I heard it preached the opposite way every time growing up. You go back and read the story. It is the ones that lapped it up like a dog that he was to keep. I don't know why. <laughs> I still can't figure it out. Joe, the other way makes so much sense. What's the... I don't know. Oh, was it just because they're animal instead kind? That's what I was thinking. Savages. Yeah, clearly. The, the, the dogs. Savages. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Maybe the other ones were too careful. Situational awareness. <laughs> Who knows? The other ones seem more aware. But they were the ones, I guess maybe they were, maybe they were dainty. <laughs> I don't know. I can't figure it out. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Either way, it was cold to how many people stayed. 300. 300 people. 300 people. Sounds a whole lot like the Battle of Thermopylae with the Spartans, doesn't it? Fast forward through the story. So, they engage them at night, and the Midianite army destroys themselves. 135,000. They beat them. 300 against 135,000, and they win. So, I was never even concerned with the end of the story. I just kept going back to the hail mighty man of valor and I started thinking man if he only sees me half as good maybe I can do something great right like I saw myself as way less than everybody around me when I walked into a room I promise you when I walked into a room 10 years ago I felt like I was the least in the room every time I don't care who was in the room I don't care if I was at a daycare <laughs> I'm telling you I felt like I was the least in the room always I always saw myself that way I really have never told anybody that. But this story, I kept going back to it. And then, I, and then because, I, because I was always like, God, why, when am I ever going to catch a break? Man, when is this ever going to go my way? When am I ever going to be able to be in a job and not get fired? <laughs> when am I ever going to be able to not fail at a freaking business? When am I ever going to be able to, to catch a break? And literally, I would go back to that story and I would be like, hey, almighty man of valor mighty man of valor he had zero a mighty man of valor has a historical record of defeating all of his foes you understand that if you break it down has a historical record of defeating everybody what was Gideon's record mm -hmm. Sleeping. Sleeping. It's zero zero record and then I, and I thought to myself, and I was like, man, that makes so much sense, actually. Because God's not bound by time. God was talking to him as he truly is because God finished his end before he started his beginning. Isn't that crazy to think about? You're not the you that God knows. The you that finishes the race is the one that he knows. Because he walked through your end before you started your beginning. How baffling is that? A little bit. <laughs> And so, and so, I kept going back to that, and I'll go back to that, and I and I and I would keep doing that. And the angel just sat there and listened to him whine. I'm like, I'm a whiner. I may not have said it out loud, but I whined in my head all the time to him. You know, I didn't whine to Nathan about it. I didn't whine to Jeff about it. But I was a freaking whiner. I was a blamer. And I kept going back to that one story and, and, and his answer to him. He, did, he didn't even address all of his concerns. He just went. Go, oh yeah, in your power. And save, wait, I thought they were God's people. No, nope, your people. <laughs> when they're acting like they're acting now, they're yours. <laughs> it's like you want to save them, do it yourself. And Gideon was like, hmm, okay, I'm going to do that. And so all of the stuff that we're doing here with the core four and the Tom Shea and the walking through the stuff with you, I mean, this, he was just walking you through how you learn to see yourself as a fuck up. Man, is that who you really are? Did anybody in this room see him that way? No. 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 But how you see you, none of these people have the key to your future. Only you do. But we're all that same way in certain areas. As Tom was talking, I was like, I see that. 
see, I see that in me here. And I was putting the things together. And I've even heard all this stuff with Tom before. Right? So I ask you, as I read this right here, this Task Force Creed, I ask that you think, you think about you and what you're going to do. The type of responsibility that you are going to take through this core four. And, and I'm going to read this creed and we're done. And the people that can hang around and ask questions are good. The people that got to go, they're already out there. So uh, you'll be walking out as soon as I finish this, okay? So I won't look back let up slow down or back away my past is forgotten my present is focused my future secure i'm finished and done with low living sidewalking cheap excuses and dwarfed goals i no longer need preeminence position promotion promises or popularity i don't have to be first i don't have to be right i don't have to be recognized i don't have to be praised regarded or rewarded i have died to a self-centered ego-driven limp lift lifestyle i live by faith learn by submitting labor by love lead by example and lift by prayer my cause is developed my decision definite my desire determined my discipline dedicated and my devotion distinct my face is set my pace is fast and my road narrow my way is tough but my companions are strong and my counselors are reliable my purpose is pure my mission clear and my values unshakable i cannot be bought compromise compromise detoured lured away turned back deluded delayed or denied i will not flinch in the face of sacrifice hesitate in the presence of the adversary negotiate at the table of the enemy ponder in the pool of pop popularity or meander in the maze of mediocrity i won't give up shut up let up until i've stayed up stored up prayed up paid up and stood up for the price and the cause of our vision i'll fight when others faint go when others won't give till i drop teach till i'll know and work till the task is finished and when i lay exhausted on the playing field of life this task force won't have any problem recognizing me as one of their own yep. that was my goal and that can be a of faith what, what's the quote that said uh, faith the opposite of faith isn't belief the opposite of faith is sight right and so it's being able to um, go all in on that which you cannot see when we say like unless you're winning in all four areas like that's like that's where fulfillment comes from but there's this thing that happens before that <laughs> To be able to be winning in your relationships with your spouse, significant other, friends, family, to be able to be winning with your body, to be able to be winning with your mind, to be able to be winning in your business, truly winning, is there has to be that relationship with God. It's like every time I have a conversation with somebody else about God, my relationship with God gets better, which obviously makes sense, but people don't look at it like that. People don't look at a relationship with God just as they would a relationship with your wife or a relationship with your friend. Like if you're not talking to your friend, if you're never hanging around your friend, if you're never a, like that relationship's going to fall, <laughs> it's going to fail. Like it's just a relationship. And like, that's why I'm so big on, you know, people want to talk about religion and, and it's not, a, it's not religion, it's just a relationship. And the way my relationship grows is by number one, talking to God, but then talking to other people about him. And every single time I do that, man, it's just like, it grows exponentially to where now it's like all of what I'm talking about. And, and I think that that in and of itself has been strengthening my faith. It's just been, as I've been talking about it more and it's being you know, more at the forefront of my mind and forefront of uh, a lot of my conversations, it's been strengthened and being able to really have some awesome, deep conversations with people about faith um, and maybe lack of faith and how to strengthen your faith has strengthened mine. And I just, I truly believe that as a Christian, we are to be God's way of showing off. Where so much, so much of the world wants you to believe that Christians should be this, um, like not, to say materialistic is not the right word, but that that income and that all these things like those, those shouldn't matter, that we should somehow be just like living on the streets, like serving everyone 24 seven. But I just feel like we should be God's way of 
of showing what's possible. And I don't think that's a popular um, you know, way to look at it, but I, it's just the way I believe. And I think you know, with my business partners and our business that we have here in the insurance industry, we set these gigantic audacious goals just like you have so that when we accomplish them, people will know that it was so far beyond our capability that God's hand had to be in it. That the only way we possibly could have done these things we've already done and will do is if God was instrumental throughout that process. And it may be like you said, it came in at the very last second and these things just happened. Or it may be all along the way, these things start to align, but that it was beyond you. It was bigger than you. It was bigger than your team. And it was, it was proof and was evidence of the power of God. Living life in a way that the only way this could have happened is that if God's hand was in it, that that's the only way that you could take somebody from being completely broke and, and depressed four years ago to where I am now is, is because God's hand was in it. I just got in our second workout of the day and it was uh, an, an intense one. I'm sure you guys just saw a little bit of that footage. My thought for you today on day 23 is this. You will either pay now for what you want or you will pay later for what you don't want. How do you know when to like listen to like either like your body or like listen to yourself about like stuff like burnout? Like when should you keep going and then when should you like really kind of hold yourself back and be like this is not healthy? Where's that line between what is good for you and what's not? Like when you have the opportunity yeah. to say like sleep in or something mm -hmm. and you're like, well, dang, I could get up, but it's like, I've been, you know, grinding all this week. Yeah. I think it depends on what you're doing. Like it depends on what sleeping in is taking you away from. Like if you're working on something that you're super passionate about, that you know is making an impact, that you know is, you know, using what God put in you, then you probably should get up and do it. You know what I mean? Um, but that being said, like you have to listen to your body. There's been a really cool theme um, from the vlog that went out yesterday, uh, the, the My Living Legacy vlog. A cool theme of stuff I've been really, you know, wrestling with this week is like this idea of like one way or the other you're gonna pay. You can either pay now or you're gonna pay later. And then we took it a step further on another recap video where I said, you're either gonna pay now for what you want or you're gonna pay later for what you don't want. And so if you think about that, like what does that mean? So I'm gonna pay now, let's just, let's just use body as an example. I'm gonna pay now and go through pain now and go through struggle now and go through being super tired now to get the body that I want or by not doing it now, I'm going to pay later but later I'll be paying to get out of the body that I didn't want, you know what I mean? And so I think the moral of that story is that you're gonna pay one way or the other. I'd much rather pay for what I want than have to pay for what I don't want because I think when you pay for what you don't want, you're always gonna pay more. Mm -hmm. I think there's more joy like paying for it. Like, because like in being intentional about it, um, instead of paying for it because you kind of have to, like, because there's no other option at this point, you know, yeah. because your your health is so bad that you kind of have to at this point, otherwise you're going to die, yeah. you know? Yeah. So um, I think, I think it's, really yeah, I think it's definitely a whole different mood when, yeah, when, when you're proactive about it. When you're looking at choosing the exact same parallel from rent or lease or mortgage is the very same with your body. It's just the very same with your business. Like, why wouldn't you just pay it up front? Like, why wouldn't you pay it in full um, every single day um, to get what you ultimately want, to not have to go to the increased struggle and increased pain of having to pay to get out of what you didn't want um, down the road. So I'm laying in bed last night and I'm thinking about, you know, how this conversation is gonna play out and really how to wrap things up. And something just kept running through my head over and over and over and over. And it was, what were you born to do? What were you born to do? What were they born to do? What were they born to do? 
and you can call it intuition, energy, I would call it the Holy Spirit. I've just learned that I don't ignore when I've been prompted that way. So I literally got up out of bed, this is like 11 o'clock at night last night. I got out of bed, went to my basement, just started writing. And I typed something out over about a 45 minute period. And this complex topic of what were you born to do or how do we figure out what we were born to do, all of a sudden became so clear to me. And so I wanna be vulnerable with you guys and just read it because there's somebody here today I know without a shadow of a doubt that needs to hear it. And I wanna read it because I don't want one single word missed that could be the difference that it makes for that person and making sure that this absolutely sinks in. Figuring out what you were born to do is not easy. There's so much confusion out there, so much noise, conflicting opinions on passion, purpose, potential. No wonder we're so lost. I'd like to offer you a new perspective as we close today. God given. It means possessed without question, as if by divine authority. In a world full of distraction, confusion, and uncertainty, how would it feel to possess without question? Confident, hopeful, secure. So what is God given? Your gifts. I challenge you today to start viewing your world through this progression. Gifts, purpose, potential, and passion. Only when you operate out of your gifts will you realize your purpose in life. Remember, they're possessed without question. Regardless of your beliefs in a higher power, you must understand that you were not placed on this earth by accident. You were given a finite period of time here for a purpose. And that purpose will require you to use your gifts to reach your full potential. And guess what happens when you're chasing your gifts, living life on purpose, and reaching your full potential. Guess what starts to emerge and begins to grow like a wildfire? Passion. But so many of us, we chase passion. But passion is not possessed without question. Passion is not God-given. Passion isn't something you have, it's something you develop. Starting with something that you do not possess will always lead to frustration. Judging your purpose, judging your potential on the wrong purpose will always lead to frustration. But our gifts are God-given, possessed without question. So that's where we start. Once you've realized your gifts, you have to share them. I understand that not everybody's built with this innate desire to be in the spotlight. But the best way to create the maximum impact is to share your gifts with the world. You see, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm just afraid of not living up to my full potential. So I want you to imagine lying on your deathbed and standing next to you is the ghost of your gifts. The version of you that lived life on purpose and reached your full potential staring at you as if to say, I was there the entire time. Look what we could have accomplished. Look at the impact that we could have made. My greatest fear is that surrounding my bed will not be the, the ghost of my gifts, but it'll be the ghost of yours because I didn't share mine. I get it, life is hard, success is hard, but guess what, so is failure. And regret is devastating. Reality, the majority of people will die having lived a life of mediocrity. Is that the legacy that you want? If you died today, what gifts would die with you? So I heard a story the other day about planes. Most people have a fear of flying, but did you know that it's actually more dangerous for a plane to stay on the ground? On the ground, the plane starts to rust, malfunction, and wear way faster than if it were in the air. But if you think about it, it makes sense because planes were built 
to be in the sky. Flying is their gift, possessed without question. See, each of us were built to live out the gifts that we have inside of us. So it is perhaps the saddest loss to live a life on the ground without ever taking off. Thank you. to the Sales Wolves podcast. My name is Tyler Harris. Joseph Caldwell. We've got Sean Whalen, and we are the Sales Wolves. Yes, sir. There we go. Was I supposed to do that? Sorry, I didn't. It's okay. No, no, we give you a chance to do it at the end after you've learned. (laughs) It was like a pause. Well, you kind of threw me off with the whole Caitlyn Jenner thing, so now I'm really confused (laughs) about what I'm supposed to do here. You know, it's all right. You it's got right. it, man. So, guys, this is episode 50 and uh, kind of a milestone for us it's in that we started this not even like it's like not even a year ago, but almost yeah. at, right at a year ago. Um, but we're super excited to have a uh, special guest on this episode. But before we get into that, uh, Joseph, you want to tell them why we do this podcast? So, the whole reason that we do this podcast is a um, cu- couple things. One, we believe that every single person on this earth is in sales in some form or fashion, whether you're a stay at home mom or dad and you have to sell your kid on eating their broccoli, um, interacting with people and doing that in a professional manner is, is paramount to learning, right? You have to be able to do that. And so we do this podcast to appreciate those people, to, to show people and give people tactical information on how to interact with people and, and really how to figure out who they are and where they want to go and how do you get there. And so, and then also for salespeople, sales jobs are lonely jobs. We've both been in sales our whole lives. I'm the CEO uh, now of Consolidated Assurance. Tyler's a national coordinator. And we've been in sales our whole lives and it can be lonely. It can be frustrating. And there's a lot of, of different things out there that sell systems on how to be a great salesperson. And we just wanted to provide the information and what we've learned for free. Yeah. Um, we wanted to give back to people and, and, um, and that's what we're here to do. So Absolutely. that's why we do this. You want to introduce our guest cause I am excited to hear from him man. he's one of, one of the people I listen to on a regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, we got a special guest, um, over the last three years, really, is, is when I've been following um, Sean um, on Instagram and Facebook. And I think he is probably the best example of a couple of things I wrote down. Number one is the documenting versus creating. Number two is not caring at all uh, what other people think. And then this one kind of goes with that. But no, the number three is being authentic and 100% transparent. Um, so to give you a little little just snapshot uh, on Sean, and we'll let him kind of take the rest of it, but he created the Lions Not Sheep movement, yep. which in my opinion, uh, and he'll give you his on, on kind of the backstory of that, um, but really to introduce men back to their masculinity. Um, and I think it's needed now more than ever. Um, but successful entrepreneur, influencer, last year the guy ran for, I think it was the 13th congressional district in Utah, Um, So MMA fighter, I mean, you name it, this guy has done it. But for me, there are a few people that I look forward to seeing their content come out every day, um, especially in a world where there's so much noise out there. He's just one of those refreshing voices that always tells it like it is and keeps it real. And uh, I've enjoyed immensely uh, the the stuff that he's put out there. And I could not be more excited to have uh, Mr. Sean Whalen here. On, the sales on, top of, on top of everything that you said there, one of the things that I gauge success off of now, being later in my life, is is as a father Mm -hmm. as a husband as i mean there's there's other things and i saw where uh some of the things you've done with your 15 year old daughter 
I've got a 14 year old daughter that's about to turn 15. And, um, and we have had some of the cool, I just took her to see Hamilton in New York and, and do some of that fun stuff. And, and I have a 13 year old daughter, a 12 year old daughter and a 10 year old son. So some of those things are the things that I value um, more than money now, you know, Absolutely. which wasn't always the case in my life. Like I have to get, that's, that's getting back to the masculinity yeah. in my opinion. So, so Sean, we'd love for you to come on and, um, you know, you can be as, as brief or as lengthy on telling your story, but really just tell everybody who you are and then we'll kind of dive into your story, do a little Q and a and go back and forth and give people some, some real value in this episode. I know. Cool. I appreciate that, man. Thank you for those kind words, you know, and, and, um, you know, the father aspect is is huge for me, as well as Christmas tree connoisseur. Uh, this <laughs> deal that we're, it's out, we're out of December. It's, we're in January. My tree is still up. But we'll talk about that later. Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I was really successful at a young age. I grew up in a single parent home. My parents split up when I was a teenager. Um, I was always a hustler. I mean, I've got all the stories like Gary. You know, I was running around when I was a kid. and I'd knock on the, the neighbor's door and say, hey, I'll mow your grass for five bucks and they'd say, great. And I'd give, you know, my little buddy $2 and I'd keep three and he'd mow the grass. And so I've got all the little hustler entrepreneur stories since I was a little kid. But I, uh, I found myself uh, really successful at a young age. I didn't have coaches. I didn't have a mentor. Um, you know, I was making a lot of money in my early 20s, had everything you could imagine having based off the temporal um, worldly success. I had the cars, I had the Rolexes, had the houses traveled the world kind of a deal um and and really was just like basing everything off of what i thought success was um which was like look at my big house and look at my eight thousand dollar yacht master and that's when they actually were eight thousand now they're like <laughs> twenty thousand um you know and, and 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 i was doing a lot of this stuff based off of what i thought success was and and i found myself really unhappy to be completely candid um, it wasn't fulfilling. I was working more. I was grinding more. Um, I'm getting ready to release my, my book or, or launch my book here at the end of the month. And I talk a lot in the book about chaos and how, you know, I was putting in 20 hour days, but at the end of the day, like I was burning the candle at both ends. You know what I mean? I had the 14,000 square foot office, had 170 employees. We were doing, we did almost 4,000, um, flips. Uh, 4,000 real estate transactions in a matter of like three and a half years. We were absolutely crushing it, but I was crushing yeah. myself. And so when I turned 30, my goal is to be retired and I had the assets and the cash and everything available. And I leveraged all of that to go even bigger, do even more, have even more success and ended up getting my ass smoked in the real estate market and lost millions of dollars like a lot of other dudes did. Um, I chose at that point in time to kind of burn my whole world to the ground. I left my marriage. I left my business. I literally walked in one day, um, handed my partner a piece of paper that my attorney had drafted up one page and I turned the entire thing over to him a year after us doing $22 million of revenue. And so I stuck my head on my ass essentially. I, I kind of went on what I like to call my little sabbatical, a two year hiatus where I really wasn't sure why I was even supposed to be here. Um, you know, I was a father, I had three kids. Um, I looked at everything as, as, you know, I was on the magazine covers. I was 30 under 30. I got all the accolades and all the awards. And here I was like going through the roughest spot of my life, like literally put a gun in my mouth and nobody was there. I was gone. It was like an island, right? And, and it was a really interesting time because um, I just lost the passion for everything. I was like, why the fuck am I doing this? Like, what's the point of all of this? I have all the shit. I have all the employees. I'm not happy. And so I went on this... Uh, I went on this sabbatical and I tried to figure out why the hell I was even on this planet. Um, and I ended up hiring a coach and going through this program and, and trying to, you know, figure myself out. And I found myself in this really interesting position where one night I, I did this post, this Facebook post as a challenge from one of my coaches to tell the truth. You know, I mean, most guys are, how are you doing? Well, I'm good. I'm good. You know, we go drink and we go golfing and nobody's really telling the truth. And that's ultimately what I did this one night. I, I sat on my bed and I talked about how I was an asshole and how I, I, I was a dick in my divorce and I wasn't a nice guy and how I was angry and I didn't have all the answers. And the thing went viral. It went crazy. Um, tens of millions of likes, tens of millions of comments were shared all around the world. It went from your average guy who was this real estate dude who had made all this money in real estate and made tons of money in mortgages and 
and flipping homes and the whole thing to now having kind of this lens looking at my life and all of these people saying, holy shit, how did you do it? Like you figured it out. You cracked the code, right? I'm like, whoa, I just told you that I was an asshole. Like how do I have anything figured out, right? And so uh, I found myself on this really unique journey where I started using this social media platform to tell my truth. And really, it wasn't to build a tribe. I didn't wake up one day. I'd never read Seth Kuden's book, Tribes. I was doing it simply because it was helping me feel better. It was almost like a therapist. Like sure. social media became my therapist and I shared more and more and more. And it was embarrassing and humiliating and frustrating and, and demoralizing, but it was truth, right? Here was this alpha male, this dude who had made all this money, who was this leader, who was blah, 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 all the bullshit, who was admitting he didn't have the answers, who was admitting he was depressed, who was admitting he contemplated suicide, who was admitting all of these different things. And this huge tribe started following. And, and it, uh, in the middle of all that, a couple of years ago, um, I went to one of my coaches, one of my mentors and said, look, man, uh, I, I want to figure out how to take the real estate game even bigger. And he said to me, one of the most profound meetings and lunches that I've ever had. He said, dude, you know, you can make money in real estate all the time. He's like, why don't you ride this wave? Like people are, are, are following you. They love what you have to say. You're coaching people now. You're, you're, you're showing people how you went from kind of the top of the mountain. A lot of dudes lost a lot of money in 2007, 2008, 2009. that are still to this day bitching and moaning about it. Um, like, why don't you share with people how you came out of this? Why don't you share with people what you learned? And, and that lunch forever changed my life. I sold all of my uh, remaining properties that I had. And I went all in with Lions Not Sheep. And I started uh, Lions Not Sheep. And really, Lions Not Sheep was me. It was like, look, I lived this life literally as a sheep. Even though I had all the shit, I had all the temporal stuff, I was following what I thought I was supposed to be doing, what people were telling me what success was. You know, flipping through the feeds. Oh, I got to have this car. I got to do this shit. I got to blah, blah, blah. Now I'm successful. And uh, I just started saying, fuck it. I'm going to do what I want to do. And if people like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. But I'm doing it for me. And I started, you know, feeling better about myself and, and built this tribe of people and launched this company. And, you know, now we're, I mean, literally the messages are spreading all over the world. Um, over 600 million views of my videos. Um, you know, it's, it's been really, really, really crazy. It's been really humbling because... I'm not that guru. I know Tony Robbins did his, his deal. I'm not your guru. I'm not a guru. Like, I'm just sharing me, man. I'm sharing what I like, what I don't like, what I'm passionate about. I talk about all the stuff you're not supposed to talk about. Sex, money, politics, religion. Why? Because every day I'm involved in some way, shape, or form with sex, money, politics, religion. It's, it's my world happening. And, and I'm finding more and more men, like you're talking about, want to figure out how to be with their children more, but we have to put on the label and the suit of success and grind and hustle 20 hours a day. You know what I mean? And, and, uh, and so that's kind of, it's kind of where I've been and, and, and where we are right now is, is just really moving this, this ball down, you know, the field of, of showing guys like real masculinity, like you're talking about is doing whatever the fuck you want and not really caring what, what he says or he says, or, you know what I mean? You want to buy a Rolex? Cool. Go buy a Rolex. But for me, I want to be able to know that I'm doing everything for me and, and for yep. my kids and, and I can tell my kids how to be successful or I can show them how to be successful. And, you know, that's really what, uh, what the last few years have, have been like for me. So, so you know, what's crazy, Sean, is with you saying that I had just the other day, we were on our way back from, from New York and my daughter I had two of my daughters with me that we went and saw Hamilton and, and, and my wife and we're on our way back and I was sitting beside a guy up in up in first class and we were talking and he was like man that is so cool because he had he had sold his soul in business and he had lived in la and he had lived that high life and he had just bought a farm in Asheville, north carolina and was just getting back to his roots and just leaving all that and and it was fascinating he said man it's good to see somebody like you that hadn't sold their that hadn't sold their soul that you're taking your kids and doing all that and and you're spending time with them and you're and you're you're really investing in that relationship and and i looked at him and i was like make no mistake my friend i sold my soul and he it yeah. kind of took him back and i was like yeah end of 2016 i was at a place where i literally was that just the pinnacle like you're talking about, but as miserable as you can get. 
And 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 I looked at him and I said, I sold my soul, but I'm buying that motherfucker back one plane ticket and one experience at a time, baby, with my yeah, You know, kids, it's funny because like no. we consider ourselves smart people, right? Like we're all smart guys. We make good money. Great. Awesome. But I'd like to consider myself a smart person. What I'm finding fascinating is that I like to read. I like to study. And I read all of these books and I read all of these these biographies of all of these successful men successful men, right? Temporally, like what, right. what we look at is like, here's a guy, here's a Stephen Covey, here's a, 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 a Steve Jobs or whatever, whatever. And we read all these books for inspiration, for education, for whatever. And really what I'm finding is almost all of them say the same thing at the end, which is if I could go back and do it all over again, I would have spent more time with my family. Now, if I'm a smart cat, right? right? If I'm, what we're doing is we're reading all this shit saying, ah, fuck all that. I'm going to keep grinding and I'm going to be different. Yeah. How are you different? Because you're working 20 hours a day. You haven't been to your kid's soccer game. You're fat as fuck. Yeah. Why not take that counsel at the end of the book? Like to me, I'm telling my clients, I'm like, yo, forget the whole front of the book. Just read the last chapter and then follow what it is that they say and, and follow that, that, that idea and that counsel. Because at some point in time, I'm going to be that old ass where I'll be like, yeah. oh shit, I read all the books and they told me what they would have done differently but I was doing everything based off of like a Facebook algorithm or an Instagram algorithm or what everybody else was thinking was worldly success. These guys have given us the blueprint. They're saying, go back and like, that's the success is the kids and the time and your own sanity. Yeah. We're trading our sanity for dollars thinking that somehow that way is going to produce happiness. Dude, read the fucking book. They're telling you what to do, what they would do differently. If you're smart, follow that counsel. That's right. That's what I chose to do, and it's provided the best lifestyle that I've ever had. And that's what I told that guy on the plane. I was like, I'm just glad I figured it out yeah. when I was 41 and not when I was 81. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that I don't yeah. have to write a book at 81 telling everybody, hey, all this shit I, that I'm not going to take with me, this isn't as important. And it was funny. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and, and he called me out of the blue. He was leaving church, and he had this feeling he needed to call me and tell me something he's all religious like you and and i was like i was like son god didn't tell you anything for me <laughs> but, but, but we were laughing he was talking and uh and and i said um and and we were talking about this very thing we were talking about uh um, this exact same stuff about the way that you live your life and and soaking up the now moments and and not selling it down the road um, but, uh, but anyway, it was, it was, uh, interesting conversation. Hey, hey, Sean, so you mentioned kind of getting to that place where you were, you were all alone. Was that the first time in your life that you had actually been alone? Like not with people around you, family around you, business partners around you. Was that the first time you had been like a legitimately alone? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I, being successful at a young age, like you're doing things. I did stuff that, that nobody else did, right? Like I was supposed to go to college and do all this other stuff. And, and I was married into a family where there were six siblings and all of them had PhDs and MBAs and all such stuff, you know, wow. educated. Uh, and I was making more money than all of them combined. Right. And, and it was like, when you're, when you're Andy Frasilla talks about being at the top and there's no top. I've never been to the top. People talk about, Oh, it's lonely at the top. Like what the fuck are you even talking about? Where is the top? <laughs> who, who has the top? Right. But like I found myself in this position where, you know, I built up this godlike complex where I couldn't lose and I was making all this money and everybody's like, dude, you're, you're just like, you know, I, 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 it was ego, man. I just kept doing it and, and, and growing and expanding and making more money and, Everybody's like, God, I wish I could be you. I want to, I want to have your life and the whole thing. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and ultimately when everything burned to the ground, when I burned it to the ground, I left my marriage, I left my business. Like I pretty much pushed everybody away, but that was really my reaching out for help saying, shit, I'm fucking alone. Right. And because of my pride, because of my arrogance, because of my ego, I was like, fuck everybody and like push them all away. But Secretly, I was saying, like, come help me. Like, what do I do? I'm afraid. I'm scared. But I couldn't do that because I was the alpha. I was beating on my chest like, ah, I'll fucking just get it all done and I'll grind it all out. But, yeah, I found myself alone, dude. And it was like, it was just such a crazy place, you know, and, and I'd never been there before. And so that was what caused so much more of, like, I don't have any friends. Like, what did I do? I felt like I was this bull in the china shop where I had just been running and bang, bang, just smashing everything around me. 
And that was really the, 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 the darkest night of my life that I talk about in my book, you know, and I literally put a gun in my mouth and, and I was having a conversation with myself about if I kill myself now and I leave now, my kids are young enough that they'll eventually forget me. They'll grow up in a normal household with a normal mom and, 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 and dad, you know, my ex had been remarried. But then the flip side was like, no, dude, you can't. Like, this is all supposed to be part of your journey. I'm like, fuck all that. I don't want that. Like, that, that hurts too much, right? Yeah. So I found myself alone. And it was really like sharing that story, sharing that experience where, yeah, and I'm still, now I'm not alone because there's all these people. But at the same time, like, I just started to realize more and more and more how this was my journey, you know? And, and I was trying to, to, to have this concept of like, this is what success was. And I had to have all these people around me. And this is what dictated my level of success. And really the success was found inside of me. It was the happiness, right? It was, it was, we hear all this cheesy cliche shit, but I think honestly, most people like have to go through it to really get it. Like you have to be on the first class flight and have somebody saying that and you have to like really go through some pain before you can figure out, Oh shit, I don't like that. I want something different. Now I'm not saying that everybody has to go through a bankruptcy or a divorce or whatever, whatever, but like if you're fucking smart and you consider yourself a smart person, listen to the people that have, what, you know, Tyler, you and I talk about coaching and the whole thing. And then like follow the shit that they tell you, like yeah. absorb it, learn it, apply it and then use it. Um, but yeah, I mean, dude, being alone was, was, was a, was a terribly scary place. Yeah. But now I love it because I became yeah. comfortable with myself because I wasn't lying yeah. anymore. Yeah. That was, it's, it's the exact, uh, so similar to my story, man. And I, I went through a, uh, a really bad termination from a job that I was excelling at and went through a really bad divorce. Uh, my family had already, they didn't live in the same area. My ex-wife's had, uh, they did. So I found myself in my home by myself for the very first time in my entire life, having grown up with a, a great family, then went off to college, lived with 10 people throughout college, got married the month after graduating college, was in a family again. And for the very first time I was by myself ever, like ever, ever. And, and for me, that was where everything started to change because I was actually able to have those conversations with myself that I'd never been able to before because there was so much noise. There was just so much going on. And, and what I'm learning now is that every single person will go through that in some way, shape or form. And it's almost as though you want, you see people that haven't yet. And it's almost like you want to, how can I give that to you? How can I have you experience the pain, the struggle, the adversity so that you can figure out on the other side, what I figured out, what you figured out, how do you, it's just like, you have to let that happen. Jeff and I were talking today about like yeah. how I just thank God that it happened to me at an early age Oh yeah, because it's going to happen. It happened to me for and, 15 years. It was <laughs> terrible. Dude. It was a shitty 15 years, man. But to see someone that hasn't experienced it yet and, and to understand and, and, and my big passion now is to see those that are going through it now, because there's a, there are those like when you were going through it, you didn't realize what you know now. Like now you right. look at now you look back at that as 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 with like your like your hat says grateful like you're grateful for having gone through that because it made you who you are now with your kids it made you who you are now as a business person as a mentor coach and leader but the person that's going through it right now as they're watching this they don't know that yet and it's really easy for us to sit up here and say like in hindsight you'll understand it'll <laughs> yeah. all make sense yeah. and everything will just be clear one day and they're like yeah screw you because yeah, they're because in that it doesn't they're take in the it. gun out of their mouth exactly right that doesn't make it in it Dude, there comes a point, and this is where I love coaching. You know, I, I have uh, you know, through lions, not sheep, and and you know, I wasn't one of those guys who's like, oh, hey, I ran a Facebook ad and it was successful. Now I'm a Facebook ad guru, kind of a thing. Like, I, I teach guys, and I work with guys that were like me, yeah. who are kind of maybe that middle aged, 30, 35, 40, 45, who are like, look, man, I have the house, I have the car, I've got everything. Why do I fucking hate my life? Like, why am I not happy? Like, I haven't fucked my wife in years the way that we used to. Like, I, bear, I haven't been to my kids' games in who knows how long. And I get that because that's, that's ultimately that space where so many people are in. When you talk masculinity, we've been in this movement for so long of, like, sit down, quiet down, slow down. Like, yeah. we were raised that way. We were programmed as little children. Oh, so I don't care how old you are. We're all in the same general area. We've been programmed to lie. 
Like think back to elementary school, like sit down, quiet down. Can I go to the bathroom? You have to ask to go to the bathroom. Like don't say anything that's going to offend the teacher or little Johnny or little Susie or whatever, whatever. And so you go from like elementary school to middle school to high school, sit down, quiet down, shut the fuck up, do as you're told. Now go to college, now do as you're told, and then go get a job that pays and get your cubicle, grind that shit out, have a family. To, and, and what I'm finding is like, I just hated that idea, right? Hated it. Now there's a lot of guys who are like, that, that show up and say, Sean, I want that liberation. I want to be able to shoot bows in my backyard with my kids. I want to be able to buy my kid a horse. I want to be able to do all of these different things. I'm like, cool, go fucking do it. Well, I can't because I got the 401k and the thing and the thing and the thing and the house and the, and the whatever. And people are going to think I'm fucking weird. And I'm like, cool, bro. You're going to die. Like, I hate to be yep. morbid, but you're going to fucking die. I don't give a shit how big your house is. You're going to fucking check out. And, yep. and, and that's where, like, I feel like people that, that don't necessarily have to go through it. But when you reach that, that pain threshold, one of my favorite quotes is, you know, when the, when the, when the reality, the pain of the current situation becomes greater than the fear of change. Like that's when change happens. So when you become so uncomfortable where you really are, that you're like, I don't give a shit what it takes legitimately because most guys say, I don't give a shit what it takes. But when you say, okay, here's what it takes. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I can't tell my truth. <laughs> can't, I can't tell everybody. Whoa, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. So you're not in enough pain yet. And so when you get to that space where you're like, I fucking, I, I'm dying inside. I don't want this anymore. What do I have to do? And you say, you know, do this. And they're like, okay, I'll go do it. And then all of a sudden they find that liberation. It's like, oh shit, this is what's possible. This is what I can have. And that's what I love about doing what I do with Lions Not Sheep and helping entrepreneurs and business owners. A lot of my clients are, yeah. you know, high level, you know, entrepreneurs, they're CEOs, CFOs, CMOs, like who, who, who have this world, this idea, this, this personality that they have to present out there. But inside they're the same way that I was years ago where they're like, dude, I, why am I not happy? And, and it's really, it just boils down to telling your truth. It boils down to ripping yourself open and sharing the truth. But most people won't do it. Why? Because the way we've been programmed, going back to when we were little kids, go, oh, you can't say that shit. You can't talk about sex, money, politics, religion, yeah. because Aunt Sally might not come for Thanksgiving dinner. And we have to have her here or else then she'll be offended. And she loves Hillary and you love Trump. And blah, blah, blah. So just don't say anything. Yeah. yeah. You're like, well, not saying anything is what's killing me. And, and I was talking to my wife about this yesterday. It was funny. I was telling her something and she was like, well, you probably need to tone this down a little bit when you're in these meetings because <laughs> it was in the, co the company meeting. You weren't here for the yeah. Thursday when you were yeah. gone. But uh, and she was talking to me about that. And she was like, because it's, it's a little bit offensive. And I was like, you know what? I'm so tired of performing. Mm. Right. Like I'm an it, it was like I'm a liberal Watering arts major now. and I've got to be a performer and I'm the energizer bunny and everybody just needs to plug into me. Right. And I'll just give them all the energy. And and so it's exactly what you're talking about is kind of unhinging that and it's painful and it may bother somebody but you have to at some point in time just go i'm going to be who i am and i'm going to do it now and this last year was my whole year for for doing that for me because i was such a performer up until up until the beginning of 2017 and that was the year like i literally walked into um a part of a ceo group and i walked into there and they were like what are your goals this year and i looked at all of them and i said i was like there are not enough men drinking from the skulls of their enemies. This is the year of the Viking. I'm going to actually pray to Odin and Thor this year. And, and literally, I'm in this, this Bible Belt community, and everybody's looking at me like I've gone absolutely fucking apeshit mad. And I'm like, you watch what happens in my business. You watch, you stand. Hide in the bushes if you're scared, but this is going to happen this year, and I'm liberating me. And, and hence, the, hence the skull. On, on the, uh, <laughs> I don't know who you killed, but there it is. <laughs> but I think what you're saying is you you have tapped into the authentic Sean Whalen, and what that does is that courage strengthens the spines of those around you.